And it really exposes that what WPATH is doing is neither medicine nor science. And so we are here to talk about it today. And, you know, I'm really a newcomer to the WPATH files. Of course, I've just received them upon release, but you guys have been working behind the scenes on this for quite some time. So we want to kind of inform anyone watching like what WPATH is, why these files are important, what's so shocking about them. But can I just ask, what has it been like behind the hmm. scenes working on this massive <laughs> document and leak? Um, for me, it's been incredibly intense. You know, we first heard about them really at the start of November. And what are we now at the start of March? So it's been a long, a long road in. And it's been it's been an extraordinary. I've learned an awful lot. Michael Tellenberg is a very, very fascinating person who mm -hmm. is at the height of his powers and yeah. who understands the responsibility of when you're given a leaked document that you have to give it, you know, you know, respect and make sure that you you produce a, a document that's worthy of the the risk that somebody takes when they do blow the whistle on something. But um, I'm thrilled they're out. <laughs> I'm so glad the W Path files are out. I just feel like I thought it's going to combust in the last yeah. few weeks. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Carrie? Well, yeah. Just to echo what Stella is saying, you know, it, it it really has been an honor because you know I'm I'm a practicing emergency medicine physician, um, but you know I work with in, with advocacy with uh, fair. Um, because there are so many, you know, difficult issues that aren't being solved within the House of Medicine, and obviously gender is, you know, one of the prime ones. So to have, you know, someone of Michael's caliber uh, in terms of his investigative reporting, his ability to articulate complex topics, you know, to a wider audience, you know, to me as a physician inside trying to make things better, it, it's just been really an honor to try and help um, with, you know, some of the health information and some of the cultural issues inside medicine. So I, I'm just really so thankful to him and his team. And of course, Mia Hughes, who again, um, did just an incredible job because you have to be able to articulate the information and the concepts so it can reach a wider audience. Um, because, you know, this is medical information. So, yeah, it's just been such an honor and I'm, I'm so happy to just be a part of it. Yeah. Mia Hughes wrote the report that is accompanying the WPATH files and it's an incredibly in-depth analytical report that covers a broad range of things. And Carrie, as you were speaking, I realized maybe we should give a brief introduction of who we are and then we'll get into the WPATH information. So Stella, do you want to introduce yourself? Kind of go in a circle. <laughs> Uh, I'm Stella O'Malley. I am a psychotherapist and um, co-host of this podcast with the lovely mm -hmm. Sasha. Um, and I'm based in Ireland. And um, it's strange because I'm up so late tonight. Um, I'm usually up late, but this is really late for me. But uh, I knew tonight would be a big night and you'd be kind of exciting. So anyway, I think I'd be just on the phone to people if I hadn't been here. So yeah. Sorry, I completely deviated. And yes, I'm a psychotherapist who works in gender, blah, blah, genspect. <laughs> and and genspect, yes, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, genspect, genspect. Is, I'm the director of genspect. And, you know, we've kind of gone head to head with, with WPATH recently um, because we've started doing conferences at the same time as they are. Because we realize really WPATH are the root, stem and branch of gender ideology. And there's this kind of, it's almost like whack-a-mole unless you kind of actually kind of address WPATH and what WPATH, everything seems to spring from WPATH. So I'm really glad that we've landed in this place and that's how we kind of met with Michael in the end and how we've ended up working together. Yeah, Carrie. Yeah, and I'm uh, Carrie Mendoza. I'm an emergency medicine physician. I've been practicing for about 25 years and I've also did a fellowship in medical toxicology where uh, for two years I, I took a call for five states out west on just overdoses, poisonings, adverse reactions, all, all kinds of stuff like that, which is obviously super helpful in the emergency department. Um, 
you know, because I love uh, critical care. And so I, I did that. And, you know, I'm in um, the Chicago area. And I practice medicine, um, you know, so which is fantastic. I It's really a front row seat to everything that is going on in the healthcare system. I call it the good, the bad and the ugly um, in terms of just how the healthcare system works. But, you know, part of that uh, early in my career was uh, when the opioid crisis was starting and scaling up and then the peak and decline and the after effects. So some of these things were um, to me just like uh, I've seen this movie before a little bit with, you know, how institutions get captured. Um, they may start out with, you know, good intentions, certainly to help patients, but how they sort of go off track and don't course correct when lots of people are getting hurt. So, you know, I've been lucky to find, um, I found FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism that works on a multitude of issues, not just medicine, but they have been just super welcoming about um, wanting to work on issues related to politicization in medicine, where physicians feel like, like they are being shut down, talking just about safety issues, talking about just scientific debate. Um, and again, the gender obviously is just really is is huge um, it, for us on in terms of what we try and do in fair medicine to depoliticize and provide a platform for educating around this because we need more um, physicians to understand what's going on, but also many who do feel real uncomfortable speaking out. So, so that's how yeah. I, I met you lovely ladies and got involved in all this. And as we'll hear, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for physicians to be nervous to speak out even within WPATH. Um, I'll introduce myself really quickly. My name is Sasha Ayad. I'm a therapist in the United States and I work with adolescents. I've been working with adolescents for over 15 years. And since 2016, I've worked with gender dysphoric adolescents and their families. And I've been very concerned about what has come to be known as gender affirming care. And I've really advocated for kind of a least invasive first approach. And um, like many people who have been in this world for a while, I've had a lot of concerns about WPATH and how they operate. So I'm really glad that we're here today to talk about these leaked files. I guess to start off, before we talk about what's in the documents, which is really important and frankly, so shocking, I want to just set the stage so that anyone watching understands why does this matter? What is WPATH? Are they a big deal? Do they have any say in how dysphoric people are treated? And what is the significance of this organization for medicine and, and mental health care? Um, I would say WPATH are integral to anything if you want to know about gender or transition in ever really you know what i mean because before wpath they were called the h b i g d a which was the harry benjamin international gender dysphoria association and they started as this fringe group in uh 1978 and i, I can go through you know the, the, how they changed but ultimately they're 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 the hq of medical transition and when people use the phrase you know best international practice they're talking about WPATH and they use that phrase everywhere as a way to kind of get a uniform response to medical transition and so when you trace back you know where did the affirmative you know model came it came through WPATH where did each and every one of these kind of ideas come from they came through WPATH so while um, there's lots of other organizations, such as the Endocrine Society and the AAP, and there's, you know, Planned Parenthood and, you know, Mermaids over in the UK and there's, there's you know, the Tavistock. Really, if you really, really study, you will end up at WPATH. There's, there's no other place you can end up. And can I just say a little bit about, you know, when the, yeah. So they started in 1978. They were like a, a, a kind of a, a disparate group of trans people plus clinicians and they just came together to promote transgender health harry benjamin was frankly a quack you and i have spoke a bit about him sasha but he was very very he promoted um trans um you know transsexualism at the time and he had written the book the transsexual phenomenon from 1966 so he was the pioneer really of trans medicine 
And so I can see why they kind of, you know, they gave him his nod by by starting the organization called that. They started bringing out standards of care the next year in 1979. They quickly brought out a second one in 1980. They continued to break to bring them out throughout the 80s and 90s. But this was when clinicians and trans people were working together. In and around, and we had a great interview with Stephen Levine. Do you remember Sasha? Mm-hmm. Where he was uh he was the head of 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 W Path and writing the standards of care. And he felt that um, he, basically the activists were taken over. This is around about 1998 to 2001. And it went from standards of care five to, th- to th- standards of care six. And um, St- Stephen Levine was overseeing standards of care five, where he said that we needed the, 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 the person who wanted medical transition needed two letters from a psychiatrist. And then almost as soon as it got released, Activists were pushing back on the idea of two psychiatrists signing off to give permission for somebody to medically transition. And they immediately set about writing standards of care six, which basically said, no, 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 you can only have one letter. You only need one letter. So they were starting to infiltrate the organization around about 2000, 2001. But really at 2007, when they changed the organization from the HBI GDA, catchy as it was, they changed it to... (laughs) WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, it really took off. It was very, very interesting that this was kind of, you know, you could argue perhaps, you know, there's a certain like huge money seemed to come into it. A lot, a lot of activism came into it. It seems to be in a real change, sea change in the internal structure of WPATH in and around 2007 or so. Then 2012, they had Status of Care 7, and by then they were starting to become a very ideological organisation, I would believe. And certainly Standards of Care 7 and Standards of Care 8, which came out in 2022, they both kind of deviate from what is a Standards of Care. Up until then, they were following the criteria. Then they were just doing their own thing, really. And so in Standards of Care 7, which is 2012, they brought out like this idea that, you know, that there was an affirmative model and counsellors and psychotherapists they weren't offering a valuable therapeutic process anymore what they were offering instead was um a facilitation to medical transition so we were demoted in a very big way sasha from being people who could offer something of value with depth to somebody who facilitates medical transition and that was the affirmative model that's the kind of the reframing of what therapy would be rather than it's 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 a process instead it's support and then in 2022, they revealed their their standards of care eight, which is an extraordinary document. And you and I have talked about it, Sasha, but it has, you know, a unique identity chapter. It has an ide- a chapter on non-binaries. It doesn't give very much credence to the d- detransition story and instead reframes it as a, a gender journey. It took out the ethics chapter and it also removed any word of experimental, arguably, so that uh, they, they that people would be covered with their health insurance. So it feels that Standards of Care 8 had really, really completely been overtaken by activists. And then a year or two later, the WPATH files basically revealed the inter- internal conversations. And you realize this is an ideological organization that's not professional, it's not medical. And it's not scientific. Yeah, that that's such a good point. They also removed any age limits for interventions. And they explicitly said the reason that they've written the standards of care the way they did is so that insurance will cover things and so doctors won't get sued. So that doesn't seem like an organization that places patient well-being at the top of their priority list. And Carrie, I'll, I'll ask you, mm-hmm. As a physician, what is the significance of WPATH? Stella mentioned APA Endocrine Society. Can you help us understand what impact or, I guess, power WPATH standards of care, the documents they produce, what impact do they have on medical care? Yeah, I mean, just obviously extremely significant. And just to get into, just for a little bit, talking about the business of medicine, um, it, we're at a, at a phase in the U.S. healthcare system where it's extremely bureaucratic 
Um, and, you know, like Medicare, Medicaid, those things were created in the 1960s. And that really was the starting point where, you know, physicians were no longer independent in the sense that the government controlled, you know, the purse strings in, 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 in a lot of ways in terms of what would be reimbursed. And so I'm mentioning that because the medical organizations, particularly the AMA, had to orient themselves differently. They basically created business models to kind of, they're sort of like government contractors. Um, the AMA, as some people know, basically create the billing codes, which is the language to translate a medical interaction into um, a billable event. Um, and they create the process, meaning you have to go through a process controlled by the AMA to get a new billing code. Um, the CDC is involved in this too, but they also um, publish the billing codes for which they make money from that. So the large amount of revenue of the AMA isn't from, uh, isn't from like dues from doctors, hardly any doctors belong to the AMA. It's from this business side. So the reason I'm mentioning this is because, you know, and maybe we'll talk about this later, but it, you know, at some point in the past, you know, 10, 15 years, I, I, and this is similar to the opioid crisis, a new market was created. And mm -hmm. I think that the advocates in this new market understood very, very well how to pull the levers of the bureaucratic machine for medicine in, in the US. Um, and one of those levers is actually getting in with the associations because they lobby the government and the insurance companies for coverage of services. So WPATH, again, you know, it started out as, you know, here's an issue group of people we care about wanting to understand how to do best by them but it kind of morphed into, I need to be allies with these associations and kind of get them on my side. And I think that, you know, the associations maybe went into it saying, well, okay, this isn't an area we know about, we trust these people, but it just went off the rails where they kept saying they trusted them and they're ignoring the evidence around the harms being done. Um, and so just WPATH as a central place in terms of uh, saying that they have trustworthy guidelines has been central to the surrounding group of organizations holding them up, which then has led to insurance companies just carte blanche covering additional services on top of the government getting into the civil rights um, lane saying, well, you know, if you don't cover, you know, then you're discriminating. And yes, we're doing this all because of the central, you know, honesty and trustworthiness of, of WPATH. So yeah. they've just been significant in terms of um, getting, basically this is about getting the services covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's exactly. what the, um, because we all know medical care is super expensive in the United States. So their guiding light has been to do what they need to do to get services covered and to become a trusted partner by these associations and, and also get on the boards of the different associations and the different bureaucratic levers. So they, WPATH has been key, very key. And they're doing all this at the expense of patient well-being. And I think what's so remarkable about the files is that it clearly shows in these conversations, clinicians know that there's harm being done and that's harm that they minimize when they speak to the public. There's a very clear distinction between the PR campaigns that they kind of present to the world and the internal discussions happening behind the scenes. So I'd like to get into some of those internal yeah. discussions and we'll just kind of lift up a couple of things. Obviously, we encourage everybody who's watching this now, read the files for yourself. What I appreciate is that they're broken down into like there's summaries, there's synopses, there's FAQs, there's excerpts that are kind of short and easy to read. Then, of course, there's all the leaked documents and Mia's report, which is fantastic. So one of the things I found really shocking is that even when patients have very serious comorbidities, very yeah. serious psychiatric illness that would make it obviously impossible for them to consent, 
physicians within these W path conversations are being pressured by their colleagues to go ahead and prescribe the hormones, go ahead and do the surgeries. So for example, one conversation was about a patient that has dissociative identity disorder. This means the patient believes that he or she has multiple personalities. And so there's this really bizarre conversation happening within this group where the physician is like, my patient has multiple personalities. How do I get consent for HRT if one personality is at the forefront, you know, the, the altar versus the other? And there are people having a conversation as though this is completely sane and legitimate explaining, well, you just have to interview all the personalities and get consent from all of them so that you don't end up getting kind of sued after if one of the personalities well, decides it. Like, key point, so you don't get sued, make sure you get consent from all the alters. It just felt like such a cynical way of dealing with either somebody who's extremely vulnerable, who has mm -hmm. all this, as well as, you know, dissociative identity disorder, it's, it's, it's highly controversial anyway, you know, it reminds right. us very quickly of multiple personality scandal that happened and the repressed memory and stuff like that. So you really feel you're in almost cuckoo land, like it really does feel like a crazy piece of conversation where they're talking about getting consent of from all the personalities. And I know I saw you were giggling there, Carrie. Every time we read it, it's like, how is this in 2024 uh, 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 considered a, a scientific, medical, serious, clinical conversation? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I certainly am, am not. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just shocked again hear, hearing yeah. that and never you know minimizing any of the the patients being harmed in fact you know one of the lawsuits the one in rhode island is about you know consenting you know somebody's alters it's just that you know just the reasonable person standard you know yeah. and it, it yeah. just doesn't pass the test you know the man on the street and no. then if you're talking about practicing medicine and and again this whole thing is in a different phase. This is in widespread practice in clinics. So what we're talking about now relates to my domain, which is actual patient care. And when you're actually doing patient care, you know, you do not, you know, um, consent people for things that they cannot consent for, you know, and the yeah. premise that somebody with um, severe mental illness, which, you know, doctors across the board who are not ideologically captured would say you cannot consent someone because by nature, they are not, you know, in a sound mind if they think mm -hmm. they have multiple different personalities. So the there fact that a clinical um, environment has been wrapped around them that is saying that 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 is okay and then thinking that it's okay that multiple different personalities exist and you could consent them is is just blatant malpractice that in any court of law would just not pass the test and it also goes against the concept the public face of WPATH that you know thorough assessments should be done um and you know that all this should be under consideration and i know there's just different debate about like what sock said seven versus sock eight but i will tell you this is in a phase of the practice of medicine and i i think that all the people should understand that some of the things going on in here where they say oh well you know it's it's informed consent and oh i told the patient everything it, it it's it's code for um you're on your own clinician uh w path um themselves aren't yeah. going to show up and help you in court they have yeah. written things at this point to make it like well we're helping you except for the times when we're not helping you because we're not mm -hmm. really going to tell you and that is the end stage of these scandals because that's what happened in the opioid crisis like you should treat wow. pain except you need to know when not to treat pain and I'll just leave it up to you. And you will see that a lot in these files that on one hand, they say their standards, they should be followed. On the other hand, they say, well, 
you're you're kind of just you know on your on your own here. Um, you need to decide. Um, yeah, so, yeah. And we, when we did the episode on standards of care eight, that's yeah. something we we talked about. Is just that actually there's no there's no decision making matrix actually at all in these documents. Yeah. It's just a bunch of you know, kind of commentary. And one, one other thing I'd like to point out, there's one conversation in the WPATH files where a physician, uh, sorry, a gender therapist seems to be bragging about how mentally ill people were that she referred for surgeries and hormones. So what she says, I've also intervened on behalf of people who have been diagnosed with major depressive disorder complex PTSD, homeless, and got at least a norchiectomy. In the last wow. years, 15 years, I had to regrettably decline writing only one letter because the person was in active psychosis. So this, this clinician is demonstrating his or her belief in this protocol of giving this medication to pretty much anyone except for that one regrettable case where they were in active psychosis, rather than saying, I have concerns that the homeless person who got the orchiectomy may not be able to care for their surgery, for example, afterwards. I mean, it's, it's the, the kind of tone of bullying is something I noticed as I was reading through these. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that. On the odd chance that some WPATH clinician raises concerns or poses a question about a patient that might seem vulnerable. The most common response, rather than echoing their concerns or looking up for patient safety, the most common response, as you'll read in the files, is what's the problem? Why won't you go ahead and prescribe? Psychiatric illness doesn't need to be contraindicated with gender dysphoria interventions. So you see this over and over that the, the clinicians are really encouraging each other to just prescribe and operate. Yeah. And even that, that, that person who was in psychosis, in psychosis in the office, and that's why she didn't. Then she said she regretted not yeah. giving that person, uh, me, me, you know, permission to medical transition or sign off on it. The, the one well, one of the many things that is highlighted in this is that the concept of informed consent, you could never really take it as seriously after having read the WPAT files, because you realize this is it makes mockery of, of, of informed consent, because when you're looking for consent for multiple personalities, when you're looking for consent from somebody with schizophrenia or when you're looking for, for consent, and it came up a few times in the files from young children who basically are described as they're a blank wall they're, they're not understanding it they haven't got high school biology they want to know can they get a deeper voice but no facial hair or vice versa facial hair but no deep voice they think i've often heard you say it, it's like is it mr potato or something they think mm -hmm. they can get this but not get that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like these they don't have an understanding of of um you know as it says you might not be binary, but hormones are binary. Like they don't have an understanding of the impact of what they're signing away. And it's not only the children that it's quite clear in the WPATH files, the children do not understand what they're actually signing away when they sign it away. But their parents are very low medical literacy too. And they're not being given the psychoeducation that should be given. If you know this, Carrie, if somebody's going into a serious intervention, it's your job as a doctor to make sure that the person who is receiving the care understands the care or else there is no informed consent. It's not informed. Yeah, I mean, I, I know informed consent obviously has been a big topic in this area and there's all different elements of it. But, um, you know, I think again, in the files, they, they, you know, show that they know that the, the, the patients, especially youth, which we all know anyways, would not be able to developmentally understand, but they admit that they know they don't develop developmentally understand, but they mm -hmm. also admit that the parents don't. I think there, there is a, you know, sort of a, a, a report snippet in there about, um, or I think it's in the video with, you know, the parents will be with the endocrinologist and yeah, yeah, yeah. They come out and then the therapist asks them, well, do you understand? And they're like, I didn't understand anything they told me. And they say that, you know, yes, they're, they're sort of 
you know, um, they, the, the therapist admits that they know that phenomenon where sometimes people feel intimidated by doctors, so they don't ask questions. So she admits that she knows that phenomenon. She admits it's specific in, in cases that she sees, but yet goes on. So it's just unethical. It's, it's malpractice. It's, uh, you know, um, obviously, you know, potentially, you know, big legal trouble for specific cases for them. But, you know, informed consent, you know, you have to understand like the the medical situation you're in, you know. So for example, if I'm in the ER and someone comes in and, um, you know, God forbid they're, uh, you know, having a massive heart attack and I diagnose that, I activate the cath lab, you know, they're consented to go to the cath lab. The cardiologist mm -hmm. is like, this is what we're gonna do because you're having a heart attack and this is why we're doing it. We're putting a stent in so we can get them. I mean, the people, yes, they're under like duress, but they, and they understand, they're like, yes, I'm gonna do that. You know, do you occasionally get somebody, I mean, I've never had someone not go to cath lab, but I've had, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses who refuse blood and they're, you know, bleeding, for some reason and they refuse blood and they understand that they could die. And so we, you know, you say to them, look, you know, you could die. And they say, well, it's against my religious beliefs. I'm not doing yeah. it. And so it's all like documented, but that's, that's consenting to not getting blood because I would be recommending it. So, so the informed consent, again, it's at a late stage with the scandal where it's so embedded in medical practice and they know these things are wrong and they're coming out and they're using informed consent in the wrong way and they're hiding behind it. And again, the practitioners are going to be out on the plank and will be sued. These people will not be yeah. protecting you. That's what you have to understand. You can't just go, well, I thought it was informed consent. It's like, you. it means that you have to talk about risks and benefits and you have to be having the right diagnosis. And we'll get into this. What are you diagnosing? What, what they don't know what they're diagnosing. The unhappy child, the, the, it's all over the place. It's like basic medicine. What are you treating? What is the diagnosis? Are you checking if your treatment has worked? What are the adverse effects? There are no treatments in medicine that don't have adverse effects. That doesn't exist. So again, this informed consent is like, well, they don't understand, but they said they won't like it and I want them to be happy. All of that is not at all how medicine is practiced. That is not a reflection of a trustworthy organization. They should say, wait a second, there's people here who don't understand informed consent. We need to make sure that we are getting the word out as to how to do this properly. Mm. And you don't yeah. see that here. So that's not a trustworthy environment or group of group of people. And, and furthermore, not only do patients not understand the information that they are being presented with, but we get a sense from the files that the adverse effects of some of these interventions yeah. are not shared at all with patients. And you can sense that they're really flying by the seat of their pants. They're making it up as they, as they go. They're kind of recommending to each other, try this, try that. Oh, I heard about this person getting this side effect. Yeah. Oh yeah, I've had a lot of people with these terrible outcomes. Yeah. But those things aren't even being shared with patients yeah. for them yeah. to even try to understand it. There was something you pointed out, Carrie, about some yeah. sort of like a liver cancer or something like yeah. that. Can you share that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, when I read this, and um, uh, and again, you know, I not just my emergency medicine, but I did uh, a fellowship, as I said, in medical toxicology, which is all about you know the therapeutic range of drugs, and every drug has a therapeutic range, but they have a toxicity. Even Motrin, Tylenol does. So, you know, carcinogens obviously is a big thing I dealt with. Um, but so on page ninety two, there's a snippet about. Um, you know, the hormones being implicated in causing uh, liver tumors. And, and, and one, someone mentions that, oh, they had a friend who died of liver cancer and that the oncologist said, you know, it was related to the hormones. Okay. So when I read that, if you're in a chat and you read that, you're like, four alarm Whoa. fire, we need to tell everyone who's on hormones that this is 
could be carcinogenic, which if you knew the history of hormones, you would know this, but let's, okay, they're in a historical yeah. vacuum. But if you see this, you'd be mm. like, oh my God, we need to alert everyone. We need to figure out it, it, what, what is this related to doses? Pe normal, that is how medicine is practiced. You don't just go like move on your way. You know, so again, as a as their role as a trusted organization that all the other organizations say that they're the subject matter experts in this area, that is shocking. And I would hope, I would think that the AMA, the APA, the Endocrine Society would be like, okay, that is Um, we, we seem to have lost Carrie for a minute frozen. there, but yeah, she'll come uh, back uh, in. Uh, yeah, because I, I, a couple of things came up for me around that whole point, around the kind of there, there's without a doubt regret, and there's without a doubt um, a, a kind of Marcy Barrows, the president says there's you know that the, the community doesn't speak about detransition, and there's yeah. evidence that they're aware of regret. There's evidence that they're aware you know there's issues around that so that they followed these these children you know from the dutch study and they followed the kind of reproductive regret that they had and they said at the age the average age of 32 these kids are starting to say that their infertility is uh troublesome is the phrase they use and i'm like 32 i'm in clinical practice and i know that like it's the late 30s and it's the early 40s when infertility yeah. really becomes quite feverish yeah. and so the idea at 32 it's like they're only starting on the concept of of infertility at that age it's still nebulous not for everybody but for a lot of people so they know that infertility has become an issue and they are aware of things like carcinogenic deaths yeah. you know what I mean that the tumors related to um cancer that seems to have been formed from testosterone when you know these things these are huge big okay stop everything let's look at this i always think of the covid and the kind of you know how much kind of tests were and how much attention was given to the fact this was experimental when it was literally a global pandemic compared to we are rolling this out for decades now and the the, the follow-up is so shoddy and you and I know, Carrie, that of that of those first seventy kids that were on the puberty blockers, you know, protocol, one of them died. So that right yeah. from the beginning, one of them died, and that was over one percent uh, death of a of a you know study with the participants. That and it, died it specifically like because of the intervention. So it wasn't like a random infection from something else. It was because they blocked this child's puberty. And they could not perform the vaginoplasty, which, by the way, already has a ton of complications, which you'll see in the files. Like a lot of these vaginoplasties, even on adults, go very badly. But this yes. child, because of the kind of um, halting of his development, did not have enough tissue to do the, the normal vaginoplasty. And they had to use rectal tissue or something like that. And that caused a necrotiting fasciitis. And this patient died. So... From the beginning, in this very small cohort of 55 youth that were studied, things were not uh, kind of like happily ever after, as somebody says in these exchanges. People no. in WPATH believe that this is a happily ever after on some level. And then in other exchanges, there are many people acknowledging we're not surprised that there's regret, you know? Yeah. And then there's the sexual impairment. I think Carrie's coming back. I can see in the messages. I think she's going to come back. Okay, good. But right. um, there's sexual impairment, and there's a a guy talks. Uh, there's there's talk of a, a guy with whose uh, erection feels like broken glass. Yeah. And there's you know there's as uh, you know bleeding after sex. A lot of talk about pelvic inflammatory disease. These are really serious issues, where in any other course of medication. That if somebody had erection like broken glass and somebody else had bleeding after sex and somebody else had pelvic inflammatory disease, it's like, okay, this this is this is not good treatment. This needs to be quality assured because it's not it's it's not good enough the way it is. 
I think I'm I'm hoping that the WPATH files and the release of them under the stewardship of Michael Schellenberger will be a, a kind of a, a game changer for how we understand, you know, how we understand what has gone on in these last few decades. Will I tell you a little bit about how Michael got the files and the sure. whole? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, last, before the summer last year, uh, a whistleblower or whistleblowers, he always is at pains to say it could be single, it could be plural. Nobody knows except Michael, um, gave him the fl- files. And the reason why they, they, this person or people, gave uh, Michael the, the WPATH files was because he'd already released the Twitter files. And so he seemed like a good person to be, you know, to give um kind of leaked files to and michael looked at them all and you can imagine imagine he didn't know much about gender and he was just given Mm. all of this and so Mm -hmm. he sought out somebody who could write about them who knew their stuff around gender and found mia mia hughes and she's absolutely brilliant and she worked she's coming on the podcast soon too yeah Yeah, by the way yeah, Yeah. yeah 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 she's so good and she wrote a beautiful report i just love the treatment she gave in the yeah. Path Files. I just think it's so well done. And I'd love her to write a book. I think there's a really good book in this. Oh, Carrie's coming back. <laughs> Come on back, Carrie. <laughs> All right. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Okay. So I'm so Stella sorry. Was ex- that's okay. Stella was explaining how Michael got the files. Okay. Good. Yeah. I'm Didn't telling the story part. of the files. Oh, okay. Yeah. For some reason so, the internet went out. Yeah. So go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It, it's the witchery. Three women, it, three women together. Excuse me <laughs> about that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So Mia was taken on by Michael to kind of, in some way, bring them into shape. And at this stage, we'd invited Michael to speak at Denver and they thought they'd be releasing them in Denver, if you follow me, that they'd be in shape and they'd release them at the conference in Denver early November. And um, now I know how much content was there. It's like they were wrestling with them, yeah. thinking, right, we'll do it this way. No, 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 we'll do it that way. We'll do it this way. We'll do it that way. And I could just imagine it must have been so, so difficult to actually, they're very clean now but there's an awful lot to it, if you follow me. So they weren't ready by Denver, but the night before um, the Denver conference, we had a party, which was, by the way, sponsored and hosted by Carrie in Fair and Medicine. <laughs> and you were at it, weren't you? Were you, mm-hmm. were you, Sasha? Yeah, you were. So this is in Denver, and uh, Michael took me aside, and, I, and he started to tell me that he'd been leaked files by WPATH, and he wanted to talk about them the next morning. And I was like, you know the way you know when the voices yeah. in the party kind of go yeah. quiet and you're going sorry yeah what tell me <laughs> yeah. and he was telling me all about what he had and what he was uh talking about and i was like okay wow and he was like duh, 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 talking all about it and so then he gave this amazing talk in denver the next morning about the w path files and you know he started the talk with you know the name of my talk is how w path ends and from the, you know, it was it was seismic. It was very very powerful. And then he invited myself and and Carrie to work with his team, with Environmental Progress, to kind of shape them so that we'd be ready for this launch, which happened tonight. So that's November, and this is March. What is it? March fourth, fifth, and fourth. um, yeah, and it, the files are still coming in, and he's still he's still it's very active as far as I can see that it's a, it's still a very active kind of scenario. I presume they'll stop tonight, but um, yeah, he we've been working with them. We met so many people in the media. We've spoken to so many different doctors, so many different people in different contexts, all to do with bringing out these files in the appropriate manner so that most people could find out the truth yeah. about what's going down. Well, I'd love to, um, I'd love to kind of get back to the story Carrie was telling yeah. about seeing this particular piece. <laughs> and then maybe we can take some questions. We've had some questions come into the sure. YouTube and our team's kind of filtering us some, some here. So Carrie, go ahead with this. They were talking about how something was carcinogenic. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. That's when I cut off. Yeah. So just liver, liver tumors um, and just the relationship that the mentioning that the hormones are related to that um, 
And, and so what I was saying is if you were in a forum or you're in a medical association and you saw that, you would be immediately like, oh my gosh, we have to warn our patients. We need to figure this out. Um, I was saying that historically, a lot of this is known um, in terms of the history of estrogen and testosterone, that they can be carcinogenic, but uh, you know that seems to be some cultural amnesia here with the, the medicines. But the, the point is, as a professional organization that is to have the highest safety and ethical standards um, in, in wanting the doctors to do the best by their patients, you would, this would be a, a sentinel event that you would say, oh my gosh, we need to alert our patients. We need to alert our mm-hmm. clinicians to figure, to be figuring this out and tracking this. Um, yeah. and, but because they're sort of a one-way street of trying to get people covered services um, and they're not functioning as a medical organization, you know, they, something like that has just passed by. We haven't, we haven't heard yeah. them speak out ab- about that as, as a medical organization. Um, so that's what I was saying. Mm. Yeah. So should we look at some questions or comments? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah. we have one here from Laura Becker, the base detransitioner. She says, it's quite timely that at this moment, I'm listening to this while designing a draft cover for my book which means editing photos of my surgical scars fresh after mastectomy. Yeah. You know, I've I've seen on on social media a lot of detransitioners reading the WPATH files and commenting about them. And I can only imagine how betrayed they feel. Yeah. Thinking that oh. their doctors were really making recommendations based on good science, yeah. based on their clinical judgment that this is going to be a helpful intervention, only to see these like pretty flippant and disgusting conversations behind the scenes, realizing that the whole thing was like a big sham. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Hi, Laura. And Laura is just one of the, you know, um, bravest and and wonderful young ladies who's who's taken this, you know, this personal tragedy that's happened to her and turned it into into good and trying to help people. But yes, I mean, honestly, when you when you're a physician, I mean, thinking that you're hurting someone unintentionally as like obviously adverse events and things happen despite the your best yeah. intentions because nothing is is perfect and we're not we're not perfect but to see that they know that their people don't understand what they're doing with informed consent that there's things like you know potentially carcinogenic or you know people having to um, do all kinds of, you know, things, uh, treating homeless people. I mean, we, we can't even, you know, get homeless people to show up to any appointments or take any meds at all for anything. So to see that uh, is just doubly heartbreaking, um, knowing Laura and all these young people trying to, you know, get on the right track. It, it, it's just, it, it's so angering and, and, yeah. and just heartbreaking. And again, yeah not a medical association <laughs> and can i can i just uh, you know i had a very poignant kind of exchange with somebody who's who's been estranged uh from her child today and i've just heard so many tragic stories you know it's not just detransition it's families estranged it's people being very hurt it's there's there's so many ways for devastation to happen in, in in this world and you know all of us have, have come across different levels of it and there's so much tragedy behind some of these stories and then you you go into the files and you see these hapless clinicians being kind of admonished by activists because for example one surgeon was looking for protocols for non-binary procedures and uh, he was told you know that's this normative to, to seek policies and procedures is this normative. And, um, you know, and it, it's like these people have been treated, you know, so badly by, by clinicians that were not only paid, but given a responsibility 
to do no harm. It really was. So there's some questions in. I want to address one question. Somebody said, any fear that WPATH might sue you? Mm. Um, no, we, we would welcome, frankly, some legal exchanges because we think we would win, you know? We think that if they if they um, wanted to approach us, Michael is very very strong on his what is what is allowable and what is not allowable from a legal standpoint, and frankly, this has been done in a very very exacting, correct manner, and so that there you know there's you know what it, what what are what is somebody going to sue us for when we we're just revealing what is there? We're not actually adding. Even one word. Nothing's being edited here. We're just yeah, giving them. Just we're left to hang themselves by their own words. Yeah. Yeah. There's some great other questions coming in. Somebody asks, um, what is the status of the files as a package? Is it accessible somewhere, but behind a paywall? Will it be released somewhere? No, it is fully accessible. Go to yeah. Environmental Progress. That's Michael Schellenberger's organization. And under News, I think it's called News WPATH Files. All of it is fully accessible there. Somebody else asks, how do we get the mainstream media involved? So I know you guys were working with a lot of media outlets, both here and in the UK. Yeah. So okay, talk a little bit about that. Well, there's a few uh, newspapers that have already published about the, envir uh, about the environment progress, about the WPATH files tonight. The Economist have released, um, uh, the Daily Mail have released, who else have released? I I think has the telegraph released on her does release that's not that's not necessarily um it's called mainstream mainstream you think who else carrie who else have released? um you know I, there's some I'm good not ones up, on the way yeah yeah but, uh, we don't want to we don't want to ruin their scoops on all yeah I'm not I'm not up on all of it. Obviously, we, you know, the more uh, attention, the, the the broader audience it reaches, the better. And then again, we're thankful to Michael because he works on, you know, other issues uh, in the environment and is not focused on this issue. So I think he has a different audience. So we're really thankful to, for that. But yeah. remember, the whole point of it, this is to stop uh, doctors who are prescribing hormones inappropriately and doing surgeries inappropriately. So I think yeah. that, you know, this is very important for the legal cases um, because there is this sort of break, um, the sort of, um, you know, WPATH is trustworthy and the science is settled. And then the science is not settled and there's a lot of complications and people are being bullied into silence. And so mm -hmm. I think you can see where this falls into, because again, you have to understand the phase that the scandal is in. It's well into practice and the complications and um, inappropriateness by malpractice legal terms has already come to light. So we're in a stage of built, you know, evidentiary uh, information um, and I think that that is is really important. So, you know, is showing the the internal thoughts and workings is not does not comport with the outward uh, pronouncements of WPATH or what is in legal briefs about that the science is settled. Yeah. Well, the New York uh, Post, by the way, has also released a, oh, a yeah. piece about oh, this. Right, so that's right. great yeah, to hear. Gerald yeah. Posner. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it? Sorry. Um, yeah. So someone, yeah. Uh, I, I should be reading the names of people who are sending us these awesome questions. So thank you, Jenny, for asking about the mainstream media. And Evan Wells asked about the links. By the way, the links are now in the YouTube chat. So you can find them there directly okay. to the WPATH files. Oh, cool. And uh, Mr. Monteith says what's next lawsuits has wpath made a statement that's a great question i'd love to know if wpath well, has made a statement WPATH i can look right while we talk yeah yeah <laughs> i think they have come back with a little bit um for starters wpath were given you know right to comment before anything was ever released and they had very little to say other than a kind of a mild legalistic kind of comment that didn't really go anywhere and uh, now that they've released, we anticipate what they'll say, Sasha. We anticipate that they will say nothing to see here. Move on swiftly. This is just clinicians, almost like uh, Donald Trump and his locker room banter. 
know? Like it's just mm-hmm. nothing to say. Keep moving. Because they're very good at as not making comment when something big happens, if you follow me. We we don't often see comment during these kind of extraordinary stories where, for example, a clinician is shown to um seek kind of um comment around the fact that he's he's creating surgeries such as phallus preserving vaginoplasties. Yeah. Yeah. Just let's just tell the audience in case they don't know what that means. It's giving somebody both a like a fake penis and a vagina. I mean or or it's keeping it's keeping keeping the penis while making a a, pseudo vagina. vagina. And the same is in the same conversation. There was talk about minimal depth vagina, neo vaginas, mm, mm-hmm. nullification. You know what I mean? Like, and you know, chest without nipples and things like this. It's just as it literally says, body modification that is not known in nature. That's what these surgical procedures yeah. is is yeah. Um, about. I mean, it's it's right. extraordinary. But but it's all it, it's it's that. But it's it's in the real world, like in my world, in the ER, it's, oh, yeah. um, I haven't met anyone yet who likes to have pelvic floor problems or incontinence or oh. likes to be on a thousand meds or, I mean, so just the whole, you know, basically divorced from like, you know, long, you know, long, medium, long-term reality, um, you know, again, is just so cruel. To patients. I mean, you don't, you know, yeah. if someone wanted that, you'd say, you know, that's not good for you. You know, that is not appropriate. Again, where, mm-hmm. where are the people saying no? Um, you know, this is- <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, I was thinking about that, particularly in one of the video webinars that was released yeah. where the, the physician, I think he's a physician, is saying, we know that these kids can't consent. We know that they're having regrets. But of course, you know, we, we, we want them to be happy in the moment. And I'm just kind of thinking about this, this very bizarre place that I think we are yeah. in as a society. Like this is a big problem mm-hmm. right now that the belief is well-being means making people happy right now. Yeah, Sasha. I mean, I do think obviously this is something across different institutions. And I think Abigail Schreier's new book, you know, touches on this. Yeah. Um, and I've talked about this before in context of the opiate crisis where, you know, it became this, you know, a pain scale. And are you happy? Do you have a good score on the pain scale? You know, yeah. where where that's, you know, it's like, oh, well, oh, but they're unconscious and they can't function and go to work or do anything because they're too doped out. Oh yeah, but they gave us, you know, a 10 on the. And then I talked mm-hmm. about, you know, the MB, the MBA, I call it the MBAization of healthcare where I think as, as um, uh, you know, reimbursements have gone down and physician sal- salaries have stagnated and there's been consolidation and a lot of physicians are employed. You know, they're always trying to figure out, you know, how to, Uh, you know, save and how to show value. And so there's also was a slew of MBAs coming in, you know, into the 90s and early 2000s into healthcare because the bureaucracy was growing. And so some of their ideas might be kind hard and make sense in an MBA class. Oh, the net promoter score, you know, the patient experience scores. So there's this terrible culture in medicine where doctors want to be liked and sometimes their bonuses and things are tied to that. So you see some of that here. I mean, I know at Kaiser, you know, patient experience scores are big. Doctors want to be liked. The people prescribing want to be liked because you're you're you receive patient experience scores. And then and then when I was at the um, AAP conference and we had a booth, I ran. We had pediatricians saying, "Well, I want the kids to be happy." So yeah. your job as a physician isn't to make somebody happy. Your job is to make a diagnosis because people come to us because they have a problem. People come to the ER because they have chest pain or have this. And again, everything is an ER. They're they're medication they can't refill or they have back pain and Mm -hmm. they don't want to wait for the MRI. Even you go to your primary care, it's like you're there for an annual exam. This whole thing with gender ideology, again, what is the problem we're solving? We're solving 
I guess, you know, it's broadened into just kids should be happy all the time. We're solving to find the unhappy future adult trans person, but we're going to find them now as a kid. Well, we know just even if you took those concepts as real, they don't even have a diagnosis. They don't have a way to make the diagnosis. So that's why you're seeing this huge broadening out and devastation. So your medical problem isn't to make someone happy. That's not yeah. what medical care mm, is yeah. about. So Good for you. <laughs> yeah, I think that you've touched upon the issue, yeah. really, that there's been a slide from both healthcare, yourself, Carrie, and where myself and Sasha work in psychotherapy of this kind of presumption that if I'm not happy, something's wrong and something needs to be fixed, rather than a kind of an acceptance of the human condition, which is lots of insecurities and worries and angst and happiness and joy and love and hatred. It's, we're very complex. And there's a, a kind of I, I, I find that the young younger people that I work with, they think there's these golden people living these golden lives and there's something wrong with them because they're not living these golden lives. And I'm like, no, 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 there isn't. There, there isn't these people out there. And uh, Abigail Schreier's book, I have to say, I couldn't recommend it enough, really, really goes for that. And, yeah. and she calls it kind of a therapeutic culture. So yeah. why mm -hmm. she's 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 called it bad therapy she's more I think it's more eviscerating the culture of school parenting therapists everything yeah all combining to say if you're not happy there must be something wrong you must need a diagnosis or medication or therapy and that's yeah. that's sending you know impressionable kids into the wrong direction when they get distressed yeah. I know we've left yeah. behind the W path files, but it's such an important point that they specifically say, I just want them to be happy in the now in the W path files. And you're like, yeah, that's the problem. Because yeah. that's not what you should be doing. Right. How would you two feel about taking kind of one more question? I think this is a perfect one to, to wrap up with. And obviously there is going to be a lot of news coming out in the in the next days and weeks about this. We, yeah. of course, will be keeping up with this. I'm sure, Carrie, you guys in Fair and Medicine will be releasing newsletters and updates and everything. So we we are really glad that we're able to just kind of initiate this because there's going to be so much more to say as this unfolds. But I, we have a really great question here. Um, oh, and yes, we just want to plug our Substack. We moved our membership yeah. community from Patreon to Substack, and anyone can mm -hmm. come there and check us out, join pay or don't pay, but of course we hope you will support us. Um, but this is a great question from Amber Levine. Fighting this madness at the local level, talking points. So as, as you two are super familiar with the WPATH files, what are the important takeaway points that regular people might want to share with coworkers, friends, school teachers? What are the talking points now that we can kind of extract from the WPATH file leaks? Well, for me, there's two things to that point, to that question. One would be if if you want to make a difference at the local level, look for um, your clinic's references to WPATH and write to the clinic and say, we have we now have new knowledge about WPATH and we don't think you should be following their standards of care because it turns out that they have knowledge that they're causing difficulty for their patients. And they also know that the informed consent model isn't working out. And that harm has been caused. So on a local level, I think everybody who is working with clinics around the world, you will find WPATH being referenced and to make sure. And the second point is every time international best practice is used as a, an argument, that needs to be exposed as that's not international best practice. That is WPATH. And that's the standards of care. And that has been discredited. And the WPATH files have revealed massive flaws in this organization that have uh, have to be urgently dealt with or frankly the organization needs to close down and I think it should close down. Yeah, 
I, you know, I think it's, it's really, it's really complicated. I, I think that it's good to say, you know, cause this is such a polarizing topic, which again, why fair and medicine, you know, is working on it as well as, as you all and your new page is really cool, by the way. So I want you to check it out. Um, I, I just think, you know, to say that, you know, I think these things start out as good intentions to want to help people. We want to help, um, heal. We want to help confuse kids. We want to help people thrive and live better lives. Right. So yeah. I think it's just, yeah. it, I think it's just good to say that and say, but you know, as things have evolved, we've just learned more. And, you know, this report, it might really be a good entry point. Again, I want to thank, you know, Michael and his team, because, you know, you have to be able to translate the information so people can understand it. So I think pointing, you know, to the report date, well, here's kind of something not not from people who've been talking about this a lot or not from activists, but it might be like a good entry point because it's complicated. And we're now seeing maybe, you know, the people that we thought we were helping is really, there's, that's really not so true. And a lot of, um, Un, unforeseen complications are happening. So we need to, you know, kind of look into this more. And I think just any analogies, again, I talk about the opioid crisis a lot, but that really generalized to yeah. where a lot of people might have had someone in their family who was addicted to prescription meds or a friend. And so I think we were seeing similar to that with, with um, you know, trans identified people. So I think you know, kind of saying, hey, you know, during the opioid crisis, you know, treating pain that thought to be like this great new revolution with new medicines, but things kind of got generalized and out of control. And we saw that there were people yeah. who got the medicines that shouldn't have had them or got too many of the medicines. And in something like that is happening now. And so I think, you know, looking at this report might be like a good, good place to start. That's, you know, a non- nonpartisan outlet that really has been interested in a lot of other things, but they have seen now, you know, that this is something that has come even on their radar. So I'd point them to, you know, environmental progress just to, to plug our, our friends over there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. You know, well, I just feel, I feel sorry for El Sasha wants to go to bed, but I'll still keep going. It's, it's still, what is it, like three in the morning there? What yeah, it's something ridiculous. I just feel that if if we can pull together all, all the different organizations all around the yeah. world who are all trying to kind of highlight the harms that are caused by ide gender ideology, I think this is a real time for everybody to pull together, if at all possible, to highlight the issues, the massive issues with WPATH that have been revealed tonight. So I look forward to, to seeing that unfold. I think it's going to have a long tail. I think there's a yeah, lot yeah. of plans that we have. We have a webinar planned for the next four Tuesdays in a row, all with different people. We've got, we've got Mia coming on. We've got all sorts of detransitioners. Laura Becker actually will be one of them. And, yeah. um, you know, Eliza Mondegreen will come on to speak about it. And a can you, you, can you say who we is? Because it's not gender a wider myself and just myself. And Let them know. Because they're going to be coming sorry, here looking for it. Oh, yeah. So. They're going to be looking for you, Sasha. And then, yeah. Not me. Uh, Sasha. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair, yeah. yeah. Fair and fair in medicine. And Genspec, we're, we're going to collaborate on a series of webinars because there is so much in here. And so our first one is. Is that tom tomorrow? Tomorrow, already? yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow, and then every Tuesday in March, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah. there's just so much. There's so much here. There's so many board. plans around this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We better let oh. poor Sasha go. I'm not. I'm. <laughs> it's not. My brain just kind of shuts off around this time. But I am. I mean, I. Oh, I want to say also. I mean, this yeah. is riveting yeah. because I think this indicates there's some hope that better care is coming yeah. down the pipeline, okay? But yeah. I also acknowledge that this is very sad. And what we saw in these files is a real that dereliction of duty yeah. from professionals. And yeah. they seem to be oblivious in a way to yeah. um, how harmful it is to do yeah. this. S somebody put in the in the chat, a physician told me in private conversations that she gave girls testosterone because it makes them so happy. I mean, there's a serious problem yeah. going on. And I hope that this really does bring about kind of a 
turning of the corner. So anyway, I, I say all that to just kind of say, I feel sad and also hopeful at the same time that this is going to really yeah. make a dent in the, the work that we are hoping for. So, so anyway, thank you both Carrie from fair and medicine and Stella from Genspect and this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll see. You and soon. I imagine we'll see each other soon. Yeah. Thanks everybody for joining us on YouTube out there thank and you. take care everyone. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.